If you're looking for magic cards, look no further than Flipside Gaming. They have all the latest magic singles and product that you need to actually leave the house and battle in Magic the Gathering. And right now, if you would like to save 10% on your orders from Flipside Gaming, use the promo code CGB at checkout. That is promo code CGB. Hello and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB. We're on the young CGB free to play account doing our mono red thing. I'm in a hurry to get things done. That was a song I think by Alabama, a southern country band when I was growing up. And here we're gonna, I'm going to keep this, the quests with red spells and I'm going to refresh this one. And look, it's all red spells. now. I know that I showed you earlier the trick of having an unfinished quest you can request to a 750. I'm honestly not sure how much time I'll have for my account this week. I probably won't be on this account every day, probably once every couple of days. So I'm going to focus instead on surges of gold for the content. But you can, if you want to, try to reroll things to 750s and save quests like I showed in a previous video. All right. Um, also, some quick housekeeping. Episode three isn't going to be for public release. I tried some things with music and a different feel. The comments were very negative, so I took the video down. If you were hoping to see that, I apologize. There's been a little bit of progress on the deck, and I can show you where our red deck stands right now. So, Fanatical Firebrands is three, Lava Runners, Shock, a Spear Spewer that we opened, two Instigators still remain, three Lightning Strikes, four Pyromancer, four Chain Whirler, four Light Up the Stage, two Skewer of the Critics, four Wizards Lightning, two Rekindling Phoenix, and 23 Land is what I'm rolling with at this time. So, Light Up the Stage, we cracked a couple, we crafted a couple, cards pretty excellent, and Skewer of the Critics is still on the menu. We could use another two of those to replace those goblin instigators. Let's see what happens if we crack a pack right away to open the party. Hit me, baby, one more time. A Mesmering Benthid is interesting. It's a big card. It's a pretty neat mythic, although it's unclear where it fits right now. Not a lot of constructed play. Nothing else very useful here, but if we ever get into Rakdos, Carnival Carnage is a very good card. All right, I'll get one more since I have the gold. Drill bit. There is a common wild card, so we can get a Spewer, or a Skewer the Critics. And there's a Tide Thaker, which is a pretty good white creature to add to the collection. We're only one pack away from a Mythic wild card. We get a pack for five wins. We get a new deck. If we play a game, it's not too big of an ask. So let's go get it. We've got shocks, some little creatures, some wizards lightning. What more can you ask for in life? Kick it on over. So what's our silver opponent jamming with? We got white mana. Do we have white, white creatures? We have a fountain of renewal. They came prepared. This could be tough. Red is always a very targetable deck and if you play white and a lot of heal cards you can probably beat red if you're trying that hard to do it you may have trouble against control decks and other things here's a godless shrine and another fountain of renewal seems at this point like the opponent will have their way with us i'll just focus on casting my spells working on my quests and once i'm out of spells to cast i'll assume my job done even if my opponent's going to gain millions of life, I'll work on the quest. Here's the treasure map. So kind of a slow hand and another fountain. All right, that's a lot of fountain. I'll head, sh I'll send shock upstairs. It's not the greatest thing when you're drawing mountains and playing against all these fountains of renewal. And we'll hold these as instant speed effects to see if we get something worth targeting. Yep, this is the dream our opponent had, is show the red deck how great they are at gaining life. At this point, I can hang on to my bolts, but the flood is real, and we're not getting many spells cast, and we're very unlikely to win the game. The opponent, maybe a settled wreckage? Okay, fair enough. I will play my spells...
and I'll skip to a game that I have a better chance of winning. I don't feel too bad about that. Anybody who wants to beat red that much can usually do it. And we get a deck. It's Eternal Thirst. We can check it out. We get some of Johnny's pride mates. <laughs> wow, planes? I get planes in my deck? Sorry, that was a little snarky. But let's have a look. So this is a life gain type deck. You've probably seen things like it. Paladin of Atonement's a rare, but it's not a very good one. It hasn't really had a home yet. Resplendent Angel is a mythic, which does have a home in various uh, angel themed decks. So that could come in handy sometime. Vraska's, Vraska's Contempt is probably the best rare that we get. Being able to exile any creature or planeswalker and gain two life, it is key in control decks, so it's a big win. If you like Vampires, Sanctum Seeker, and a lot of these cards can play with Vampires. Leonin War Leader, it's a rare, it's okay, it's nothing too special. Champion of Dusk is great for your Vampires, and the rare Dual Land Isolated Chapel is a good find. Nothing that goes into our deck, though. This time we have some one drops with light up the stage, which could be very fun. Let's see what happens. Wait for the opponent, I suppose, to decide what they want to do. And here we go. I like leading with Firebrand and getting in the damage when and while I can. Lava Runner can sometimes get through better later when there are two spells in the graveyard anyway. All right, so now we have a Wizard's Lightning we can fire off with our Lava Runner. We could also hit, then light up the stage. I actually like playing out my creatures. It can run into something like a Cry of the Canarium. I think that's okay, but we'll see. I like having a board presence. There are a few ways to play that situation. It is unfortunate to see Moment of Craving on our Get to Lava Runner. Mostly because it raises the price of our Wizard's Lightning. So let's get in there with our Firebrands. And let's light up the stage. So we do hit a land. So we'll play this. And I could play this and play another light up the stage. Hmm. I sort of like holding it back in case of Golden Demise or Cry of the Canarium. So instead, I'll light up the stage one more time. Okay, we hit a Shock, which I can cast on end step, and then I can cast Creatures to refill on my turn. So we'll say go. We definitely have, creature, have two uh, spells in the graveyard now to power up our Lava Runner, so it will have haste. So whether we play it this turn or next turn is just a question of using our mana. And since we have the shock, we're going to use the mana anyway. So here's two points for face. There's another Lava Runner, but we want to play this and we want to play the Pyromancer. Because if we don't play them by the end of this turn, we lose them. So it's a use it or lose it scenario. And we're just piling on the damage onto this blue and black mage. Oh, it's an Esper Mage. All right. And it looks like the opponent wants to say go, possibly sitting on a Vraska's Contempt, but they don't have the mana for Settle the Wreckage, which would exile all of our attackers. We've got a pretty lethal-looking hand. We could go for a Lava Runner. I think I will. Since our opponent can't kill all of our creatures, we may as well play another. Our opponent has an Absorb, which will gain them three life. But then they're taking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So if these hit, it's all she wrote. And burn, baby, a burn. So now we have uh, 40 white or black spells for a pack. Well, those aren't red cards. And look how close we are on this red quest. 
So, white spells or black spells? We should get our pack so that we have access to a quest for a deck the next day. Now, it's totally fine if you want to do this. If you want to, my friends, you can play the deck exactly as you unlocked it. No problem. I prefer to play monocolored, super aggro -y builds to get the quest done because I don't actually... Um, when you're new to Magic, you might have a lot more fun with this than I do as I've been playing for 20 years. Um, I don't get a lot out of just playing a new um, pre-construct deck. I, like these quests, I personally want to get through them as quickly as I possibly can and uh, get back to using powerful decks because I already know, you know, I know the best cards in the meta. I've got ideas of what I want to play. So this is a bit of a detour for me. And I'm basically, I jam the cards, hope to get, get it done. And then once the quest is done, I can get back to what I really want to play, which in this case is mono red, ranking up, building my collection. If you're new to the game, there's absolutely nothing wrong with, and even if you're not new to the game, what, wherever you are at in your game experience, if you enjoy playing those pre-construct decks, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, I'm not doing this to tell you that you should do this my way. I understand that my way is mostly about what I enjoy, and uh, your way should be about what you enjoy. There you go. Got really deep there. <laughs> so I'm just filling out a deck. I really just want a fast, like, aggressive white and black deck. I don't like building multicolor decks because multicolor decks have mana problems and I don't have access to rare dual lands, which is what I really want if I'm going to build a multicolor deck. And so I'm just going to play this super fast beatdown machine. I guess the chaplains are a bit much. Probably don't need that. They're pretty slow. Pretty weak, no evasion. I guess we're just trying to hit the opponent as hard as we can. Taking vengeance, only hitting tapped creatures is a bit of a problem. So I don't want too many of those. I guess moment of triumph and tactical advantage. Well, triumph is way better than tactical advantage. So we're gonna use that instead. Just try to be really, 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 really aggressive. We got a few flyers to try to finish the game if the opponent manages to drag it out, but the rest is just trying to stay extra, extra aggressive to get the quest done, you see. This way, if we can cast how many spells? I think it's 40. We're good. 24 planes. I do have some 6 drops and some 5 drops, but I think I can roll with 24. I don't want to overload it. I'm not going to give this deck a name. It's only around for a quest. Well, probably just do badly in ranked, so I'll go to regular play mode for this. And it's totally fine. Absolute medium. The, the, the barest of the bones. The vanilla of vanilla and an aura to throw at it. And here comes the Fountain of Renewals. They are out in force today. And a gateway plaza that can produce mana of any color, so who knows what we're dealing with. I'll play the Swift Claw. It can deal the most damage if the opponent doesn't kill it or put something in front of it. A pride mate. And another gate. So gates and mates, I guess. Let's see if the opponent is willing to trade with the Swift Claw. No, they are not. So I'll go with the Pegasus as something that can fly since the ground might get ugly. The opponent with the combo here of Fountain of Renewal and a Johnny's Pride Mate. I feel a little silly with Pride Mate in my deck. I may not have any Healer's Hawks or good ways to gain life. That may be something I took for granted is all these cheap life linkers in the past. Our opponent has Shalai, so they have a better draw than we have. But I have Sarah Angel. The opponent, I don't think, wants to trade either of their cards. So I'm just going to power up the Swift Claw and get in there. And, yep, sure enough, take in the damage. Eventually, their creature will be bigger than the Swift Claw, but I feel like I need to get damage in. 
Arcane Encyclopedia is another slow card. Their last card is a secret. What could it be? Sheltering Light, Indestructible, and Scry 1. A very good combat trick that could have traded with the Swift Claw, but the opponent used it instead to get aggressive. Find that interesting. Well, that's, that is also interesting because we can make our Swift Claw too big for combat, but at the expense of playing a Sarah Angel. I think I'm going to attack with everything. I think my opponent will block and kill probably the Pride Mate, maybe the Pegasus. But I don't think those cards are going to do me a lot of good anyway. So I'll just get a lot of damage through and play my Sarah Angel. And then I'm going to focus on pumping the Sarah Angels. Ooh, all the damage. Down to eight. That's pretty stunning to me. Here's Sarah. Let's see how the opponent gets out of this. They do have a Healer's Hawk. They're drawing extra cards, but they are at nine. And I'm pretty much just throwing everything at them, trying to tempo them out of the game. So let's play the Sarah Angel. Let's use Geared for Battle. We'll put a token here and a token here, I think, so that both of our flyers are too big to be dealt with. Otherwise, an opponent could gang block our Angel. Then we'll send these creatures at my opponent. If I throw these in there, I think the opponent will kill one, kill two, and they're probably better served trying to absorb hits from our opponent at this point. So let's throw in the five powers. And the opponent wants to keep Shalai the Angel and lose the rest of the cards. So they're staying alive, and Shalai can grow, but... The Sarah Angels are still too big. Shalai uh, for six mana is plus one, plus one onto all creatures. What does Radiant Destiny choose? Angel? Okay. So they have a four five. It still can't really take on my creatures. Unfortunately for me, the opponent says good game. Fortunately for me, I can't kill the opponent yet, though. I could attack with the Pegasus and get my opponent to one, but... Hmm. Is that the right play? I don't think so. I think the opponent won't block anyway. So now they are at one. I'll sandbag a land just to make my opponent wonder what it could be. Here's the pump up, but it's not good enough. Because we have too many flyers and a Hieromancer's Cage. I suppose we have to cast spells as our quest, so it requires a little BM. Bad manners. And our mighty geared for battle Sarah Angels carry the day. Yep, those are a bunch of white spells. <laughs> Woohoo! Let's tear this place apart like Vivian Reed would say. The Silverbeak Griffin's probably the best of them. A flyer can get in over the top of the creatures from the green deck. So I'm going to lead with that as damage is our priority. Drawing another flyer is very good. Opponent with a sap herd. So it's the sapperling deck. Good at making a whole bunch of little creatures. I think what I'll do is suit up my Griffin and go aggro. Hope that my opponent doesn't have Tender Shoot Dryad and some of the Lords that come out of this deck. And just try to race them down. Oh no, Vicious Offering. That's the bad side of Auras. When your creature dies, it is a big turnaround in the game. Let's see if we can draw something. No, we didn't draw the land for the Shalai, so... Now that we can't race very well, we'll play Bishop Soldier, a little bit of lifelink. Swift Claw is particularly bad when your opponent can make 1-1s one forever and ever. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's fine. We both need our... I, I need to keep the creatures in check. Here's Shalai, but I don't think I want to play Shalai. I think I want a Swift Claw to trade with the next Sap Herd. Our opponent seems to like being aggressive. 
and I'll play a soldier. So what I'd like to do next is get Shalai on the battlefield so that all my other permanents have hexproof. And then I'd like to Knight's Pledge the Soldier, probably, depending how bad, how many creatures our opponent has. They play Twilight Prophet, though, which that has to go. So the Cage can exile the Twilight Prophet, because if it sticks around, our opponent's going to start gaining life and drawing extra cards. Drawing extra cards is not what you want your opponents to get to do in Magic. It's a big part of the game called Card Advantage. And the person who draws the most cards in most situations will win. So our opponent makes a whole bunch of 1-1s. We're going to need this flying presence. But I really need it to stick. So I'm wondering if the right play to do would be to put the Knight's Pledge on something like the Bishop Soldier or the Pride Mate. And then my opponent might kill it. So I'm going to put it on the Pride Mate so I still have a Soldier. Maybe I should put it on the Swift Claw since it's the worst card I have. And it's really useless without the Knight's Pledge. But what I'm trying to do is get my opponent, if they have another Vicious Offering or Murder, to use it on one of these creatures so the Shalai can stick around. Because we need a Flyer. This board has way too many creatures on it to attack through. So a flyer that survives would be a big story and big game. All right, well, our opponent hasn't taken the bait. So let's get the angel down and we'll see where this goes. Let's hope they just don't have a removal spell. That's a very good card. Now, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under my opponent's control, they explore, which means they can get a plus one, plus one counter or draw a land. Remember what I said about drawing the most cards usually wins? Drawing a land isn't much different. I'm going to hold that back. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm going to at least wait a minute. It might be a better surprise somewhere. It's always good to have something in the bang, but oh no. Uh, and the top card is an Assassin's Trophy, which can destroy anything. That's so good for our opponent. So Shalai is most certainly dead. Here's another Pride Mate. We'll play this targeting the Shalai because it's about to die to the Assassin's Trophy. And we'll play the Pride Mate. And away we go. Down to nine. We'll have to draw another Flyer right off the top. But every turn that we don't, and every turn our opponent plays a creature and gets to use Path of Discovery, we're closer to death. And this Slimefoot can make basically as many Sapperlings as they could possibly want. So I think we've lost the game. Don't think it was particularly close. And yep, so I think what I will do is play my Moment of Triumph and then concede. So we got our spells cast that we could. And now we'll move on to a game that we have a better chance of winning. Because the win rewards are part of the grind that we need to focus on as well. I don't believe in spending a lot of time losing games if you don't enjoy it or it doesn't really help your quests. In this case, the most, the best I could absolutely do is have like a one white spell every turn for the rest of the game. And I can do that with a new fresh seven hand as well. So, if some people uh, might feel that that's not the most sporting way to do it, conceding to opponents uh, well before they get to play their spells, but they also get their win rewards. So, it's not that you're not helping them. You certainly are helping them, and they are getting those win rewards quicker than they would otherwise. So, I don't agree with the assessment that I'm being a poor sport or that I am uh, somehow doing something wrong by conceding. So, against the white deck, I'm pretty sure they'll play something to get in front of the swift claw but it might be in a johnny's pride mate which the swift claw would probably get one attack through before the opponent decided to do something else and it looks like they're on eternal thirst and a paladin of atonement okay so that is the rare we looked at before i don't think the opponent will want to trade here because their paladin atonement can grow bigger and bigger but let's ask them do you want to trade 
They do not. They go to 18. Now that they've lost life this turn, the Paladin of Atonement will gain a plus one, plus one counter. It will be hard to wear their life total down. We're going to be asking Danitha, the Paragon, to help us out with First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink, and it makes our Aura spells cost one less. Opponent plays the Forsaken Sanctuary. Taps for white or black. Continuing to look at their hand. Maybe that's they're just getting used to Eternal Thirst. There's Take Vengeance, killing the Swift Claw. But attacking into the Paragon would be bad. It has First Strike, so it would kill the Paladin. So now we can attack with our Danitha. It will make the Paladin a 3-3, but you don't want to worry about that too much. You have to keep attacking. We're an aggressive deck. We're, we're kind of only built to do one thing well. All right. Now at this stage, I'm going to play the Swift Claw. It might still get one good attack in before this gets too big. And I'm going to play the Griffin because it goes over the top of the Paladin. Another tap land. It's probably about time the opponent adds another creature, but we have an, another Ajani's Welcome. So much life gain. Another Ajani's Welcome. So as long as they have creatures, they have a lot of life they can gain. All right, I'm going to attack with everybody because I have Moment of Triumph in my hand. I'm going to do it nice and quick so it looks like I didn't think about it, so the opponent doesn't believe I have a trick. But they're letting it through. They're pretty... They, they can probably see that trick coming. It's not that hard to tell that I have a something up my sleeve. And now we see if the opponent has more creatures to play or not. Their creature is now a 4-4, which puts it in a pretty scary spot. It can block most of the cards I have. Opponent's reading Danitha a few times. Perhaps they plan to kill her. Another Bloodletter. This will gain four life. Pretty massive amount of life. All right, pretty bad draws. Let's keep attacking here. I, hmm, I guess I may as well attack with the Griffin. I have other flyers in the deck too. Hell, let's let's just send everybody in. There's only one good block for the Sky Marcher and the Paladin of Atonement. Whatever it blocks, we can Moment of Triumph to get it off the battlefield. Then we hope our opponent doesn't draw more creatures. The more creatures they draw, the harder they will be to beat. Opponent debating what to block. They do block the Danitha. This will cause them to lose their Paladin without a trade, which is pretty unideal, but I guess they decided they had to take the risk. We're going to keep this land in our hand to make our opponent think about things we might have. We trade off the Swift Claw and a Bloodletter. We get to keep our Griffin and our Soldier. I think that went about as well as you could hope. Now it's all about how many creatures can the opponent make, how much life can they gain. If they use a card like Call the Feast, they can make a ton of creatures. The Bloodletter. Yep. We're ourselves up to 30 because of Lifelink from Danitha and the Soldier, and that is a really good draw. A Pride Mate can grow when our Lifelink creatures hit the opponent, so let's attack. Sky Marcher has to decide what to block, chooses the Griffin. First strike damage hits first, then extra damage, lifelink goes off, so Pride Mate grows. They actually changed Pride Mate, so it's a it's officially not a May trigger anymore, so that it basically speeds up the game incredibly, which is a wonderful change to the game. Our opponent finds a fifth land, they probably drew that, which is good. It's good for us. There's a murder. Ooh. We lose our Pride Mate. It was going to do so much damage. But Danitha and the Soldier are not done. Our opponents fall into nine. Do they draw creatures, or will they draw some lands, some spells, things that aren't as helpful, and they will concede. 
So all those Ajani welcomes, if any of those had been creatures, it would probably have been a lot more helpful for our opponent, which is why I don't believe in playing cards like Ajani's welcome too often. All right, we're on the play. We have an inspiring commander and some three drop soldiers, humans. Inspiring commander is such a fun card for the deck though and can help us with our quest because it might let us play a lot of spells. I'm going to keep this hand even though it's not very fast. It's surely on the power of Inspiring Commander, which is whenever a creature of two or less enters a battlefield under your control, gain a life and draw a card. If we just play a bunch of our two power things, we can draw a whole bunch of cards. And if we draw a bunch of cards, we can play a bunch of spells. So maybe we can play more spells than we've been averaging, thanks to Inspiring Commander. Help me, Inspiring Commander. Inspiring. Help me inspire Wing Commander. You are our only hope. Get out there, Aragorn. Give him the speech. There may come a day when mankind breaks all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. This day we fight. I don't know enough of the speech to do it well, of course, but I think every Lord of the Rings fan knows what I'm getting at. And here come the merfolk. So our opponent's going to have a 3-3 Kumena speaker right away. Ouch. So I'm going to lead with Danatha and then follow with the officer to give Danatha a plus one, plus one, so I gain some extra life. I'll probably have to take some damage here. I, I want my opponent to attack in a little bit. I don't want them to be able to gang up on Danatha. It does depend what's in their hand and what else they play this turn. So the opponent having a read, figuring it out. Which merfolk do I play? The tough questions in life. Silver Gill Adept revealing Tempest Caller. That does mean they probably don't have other merfolk besides this Tempest Caller, because that is not what you want to reveal. You do not want your opponent to know that is coming. Our opponent may just not be thinking about that, though. Jade Bearer. Make it bigger. Would it like to attack my precious? Yes, it would. That's a problem. Tithe Taker. Let's play Hazada, Hazada officer. Pump up Danatha and get in there with some vigilance and some lifelink. Try to heal back up, repair that life total. Opponent takes it as they probably should. So now, how will the opponent proceed? They drew their Hinterland Harbor, a dual land. It's very nice. They put my creatures to sleep, and they are very likely to put me to sleep as well, since they also have a Tempest Caller and eight points of damage they can attack for. So we'll play out our white spells. And if the opponent acts quickly, I have no problem with letting them run me over, deal some damage. As long as they're quick about it. Yep, we're focused strong deck. No shame. Very good in the creature matchups because they just have sleep and tempest collar to completely ruin any plans you had for blocking. And we kept a slow hand. So eight more spells to go. We never got to be inspired. The commander's speech never came. Doo doo. Another very slow hand featuring the commander and on the draw. We saw how that worked out last time. Let's try mulliganing instead. Another slow hand, but there's a two drop on top. So it's going to get better. It will get better, my friends, I promise. We need to cast eight spells. I've got four. Get comfy. This opponent is not in a hurry to make this play. All right, Memorial to Glory. 
we'll hit it up with a planes. If you're wondering what that sound is or what I'm doing, I'm getting a vitamin C type supplement drop, which I've been using to keep my voice nice as opposed to getting sore and painful. Ooh, hear that sound effect. Is that the addendum sound effect? Reclamation Sage, no target. Interesting. Tithe Taker's ability, after life one, when it dies, I get a 1-1 flyer. During your turn, that is the turn we're on, mine, my turn, spells your opponent's cost, cast cost one more to cast, and abilities cost one more to activate. I don't think that will be much of an issue against this opponent. Hard to say, but it doesn't look like it will be. So let's play the Officer. Let's pump the Tithe Taker. Let's attack. I want the Tithe Taker to die so I can get my 1-1 one, one flyer attacking as soon as possible. That's my plan. Behold, a black and white spirit. Helm of the host. Oh no. At the be a very popular meme card. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token. It's a copy of equipped creature, and it has haste. Right now, our opponent only has these one ones. Not a big deal, but it could become an issue. So, do we play the war leader or do we play the flyer, Shalai? Our opponent can probably gum up the ground all that they possibly want to, but the war leader is so aggressive. I think I'll attack first, see if our opponent blocks the, the officer here or takes the damage. We definitely are aggressive in this role. The longer the game goes, the worse things get for the Helm of the Host here. And I think I will play the War Leader just as it represents the most damage. Alright, our opponent, if they want, could equip Helm of the Host, but they would only be making 1-1s. One That's not a powerful effect, and probably not worth 5 mana. So, I expect them to play some other creature, and here's a good one. Angel of Dawn... When it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain plus one, plus one in Vigilance. So these got bigger, but the opponent didn't attack. They still did not have a great attack. All right. Let's attack with what we have here. Not the 1-1. One, one. It just gets eaten by Angel of Dawn, which I'm sure is a card the opponent plans to keep around. Here are some blocks just trying to stay alive, I'm sure, and get to use Helm of the Host. I'll play out my Flying Angel. It makes it so it's hard to attack, but remember, when this is copied, it will create a plus one, plus one every time it enters the battlefield. So they will be four, four angels that can attack through Shalai. And yeah, because they have Vigilance, we absolutely have to take it. We could kill the equipped creature, but they would just equip the next one. So I'd rather be more aggressive. And you. I guess the opponent double blocking is my concern. This could buy me time by actually absorbing a hit from one of the angels. So maybe that is the right play. It's pretty tough. Maybe absorbing a hit from the equipped angel isn't as bad as I think it is. Still, the opponent doesn't have a life gain. I'm going to just, I'm going to push damage. I'm going to push for as much damage as I can. The opponent's going to gang up on War Leader. We're going to make sure that we kill the equipped creature right now. Which is not the token. The token is not the equipped creature. So, there you go. This makes the opponent spend their mana to re-equip the next turn. And here is Bishop's Soldier. And we did the best we could. Can our opponent answer the board? A Tender Shoot Dryad. I don't think that will be enough. Says, does 
not have vigilance because the vigilance is created when it enters the battlefield, which it didn't that turn. And that's the concession. We have a bunch of cheap creatures, a Knight's Pledge and a Danatha. Of course we keep. Red and green. Druid of the Cowl. Ramp creatures. So I will play Tithe Taker. I think that my plan, no. I'll play Pride Mate, then my plan is to play Danitha and the next turn pledge it and another Pride Mate and hopefully grow all of my Pride Mates at once. If our opponent has a giant creature, that may not be an option, but at worst case scenario, I just want to cast three spells and wrap up the quest. Vine Mirror is here. It's a pretty solid creature, 5-3 Hexproof. Can't be blocked by black creatures. Not a problem I think I'll have. But will probably hit us for 5 next turn. It won't be very fun. Our only hope for victory in the game is that the opponent can't kill Danitha. Don't, don't touch her. Don't, don't point at her. Don't do it. Llanowar Elf. Don't, don't, no, don't. Okay, they smashed the Pride Mate, which is plus two, plus two, and fight. So, and I'll take the seven. I need Danitha to live. So here comes a Pride Mate. Here comes a land, here is a Knight's Pledge, which you'd think a Knight would have already taken. And here comes all that lifelink, all that vigilance, all that first strike, and it grows the Pride Mate. And I believe that means the quest is completed, the ring has been destroyed in the fires of Mount Doom. Sunder Shaman, that is a very, very big, big beefy thing. Oh no, don't. You don't want to do that. Our opponent could have a titanic growth, I suppose. Yeah, if they do, then I lose. But I think they just made a mistake, and they did. Oh, geared for battle. What a card. Now it's big enough. Now Danitha can spar with the shaman. And I'll leave this creature back just to have something to block the Sunder Shaman. I can't have, if something, if somehow she weren't able to block or this got bigger, I do not want to lose my Knight's Pledge. It's holding everything together. It's the rug from Big Lebowski. It is tying the room together. Charging Monstrosaur can hurt very badly. So if I attack with Danitha now and the opponent double blocks, I can kill one, but then the other would kill Danitha, which is a bit of a tragedy. And now that I've drawn History of Benalia, eventually it will give a plus two, plus one bonus to Knights, which may be a better time to attack. I think I'm also attacking with Pride Mate here. If the opponent wants to double block the Pride Mate, then they're down a creature to deal with Danitha. So I'll kill the Sunder Shaman because I don't want the Sunder Shaman coming over and wrecking my Benalia or my Knight's Pledge. So happy to watch the Pride Mate go there as long as it keeps Danitha in control of the board. Another big creature would be scary, but it's a Dr Draconic Disciples are two twos and for seven mana and a tap, they can make five five flyers, which is scary, but we're okay right now. Let's keep pumping Danitha up. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Bam. Super, super night Danitha. Is it, is it dragon time? It's dragon time. But now two five fives won't kill Danitha because she's up to seven power. So she would kill a creature first, then they would turn around, try to kill her, but they would see that there's only a 5-5 five, five left if there was a double block. And drawing Resplendent Angel, which if I gain 5 or more life in turn, I make a 4-4 four, four Angel, 
is pretty awesome. Keep her coming. Every time she hits now, we'll also gain an angel. And there it is. So much power. So much toughness. So much lifelink. So much flying. Another Sunder Shaman. Some very large bodies. That is true. So now... If the opponent triple blocked Danitha, they'd be okay. So we have to attack with enough things that triple blocking isn't an option. I think that requires attacking with everybody. So that's what we have to do. And the opponent's going to scoop it up. So if they can't triple block, then they have to start chump blocking away. And I may give up some material, but I think I still come out the victor. So there you go. We got some prizes and packs. We got our card reward. We completed our quest. We don't have to play that white deck anymore. But in s let's cash these packs in. What did we get from core? Another pyromancer, a mythic wild card, an uncommon wild card, a demanding dragon. And from Ravnica Allegiance, how about a skewer of the critics? Yes, we did it. And an uncommon wild card and a simic ascendancy. Let's go edit up the deck for its last run of the day. We have the skewer. And did we have something else? Well, we have the uncommon wild card and we have the common wild card. So we can have our fourth fanatical firebrand if we want, which I think is great. Um, these lightning strikes are still on the way, but we could finish that deck. There'd be nothing wrong with that. Yep, let me just grab my Firebrand. Remember, if you want to wait to unlock the decks, if that's like your plan of attack on the format, that's totally fine. You can do that. I'm not telling you not to. It's perfectly reasonable. There's nothing wrong. But I get, it's it, it's my show over here. I gotta do things my way. So I could do the fourth Lightning Strike. I've got two Rekindling Phoenix. I could do the 23rd Mountain. But yeah, I'll just grab the Lightning Strike. I like having a complete deck sooner. I don't like waiting for it, so. We have a Spear Spewer instead of a Skewer, but I would probably replace that. And then we have like four more cards, which could be another like aggro creature burn spell, something like that. But I like the Phoenix. It's been doing me good. So we can jump back into Ranked and knock out the quests for the day. Red mana doing red things, let's go. Blue, Misclo Terald. I believe in killing these on sight. If the opponent doesn't have a creature, they can't throw a Curious Obsession on it and dive down protect it. So I believe in killing them right away. Pretty good matchup for us against the blue deck. Not always though, Tempest Jin can be a house. There's another Herald. Can the opponent protect it? Let's find out. I'm going to put out a Chain Whirler. If the opponent has a dive down, I can't attack either. It's possible I should have attacked first. So it bees. Oopsie daisy. Still, I didn't lose my Pyromancer. It might be just plain better to have the creature on the board to deal damage if the opponent wants to attack me with their Curious Obsession nonsense. But let the party begin. Card off the top. It is a mountain. They stopped me on upkeep, so we'll probably see a Merfolk Trickster, which is weird. No reason to play that on upkeep that I can really think of, but there you go. Tap down the Chain Whirler, prevent the damage from getting through. But I don't mind trading with some amount of Trickster. So, we well, will Lightning Strike away the Miscloaked Herald to get rid of that Curious Obsession stuff. That gives us enough spells for Gitu Lava Runner to do its thing, and we'll send our creatures. Or 
We're in a little bit of a bind against a Tempest Shin, but Rekindling Phoenix might match up well with that. The opponent takes it. Maybe they have another Curious Obsession. Okay, they have a Tempest Shin. There's a light up the stage. I'm thinking about attacking with everything, losing my Chain Whirler, and then playing another Chain Whirler. I am, the opponent might block in a way that doesn't allow for that, but I still think it might be the right play. Either way, damage gets through and we get to light up the stage and hopefully hit our land drop and Chain Whirler. Let's see how they set up the blocks. They do not block at all with the Tempest Shin, so that's another reason to bluff, my friends. Let's do light up the stage. We do hit our land, which means now we can play other Chain Whirler, continue to work on our opponent's life total, and have a Lightning Strike ready for next turn. The Jin is getting stronger. And there's the concession. The opponent doesn't want any more of that. It is a tough matchup for blue. And there's the gold. Boom. Got it. All right. We can buy two more packs on our way out the door. See what we get. The, number, the way to really like build up your collection is through buying packs, so I make a habit of spending my gold unless I'm saving for a new set or something of that nature, a specific reason. Mirror March, okay. It's kind of a fun little card. And... Priest of the Forgotten Gods, a very fun little card for the aristocrat style decks. So there you go. We've got three uncommons and a mythic rare hanging out in addition to our completed red decks. Pretty completed. Uh, I think the last thing I want to do is replace a Spear Spear with a Skewer of the Critics, and then I think I'll cut the Rekindling Phoenix and a land for Flame of Keld. So we have the uncommons to do it. Let's get it done. The only problem with Flame of Keld is how does it work with light up the stage? It's not what I would call a combo. Still, however, it's a very strong card. I guess I could also play a few other cards in the spot, like Electrostatic Field. So maybe it's not something I actually need to craft. It was just my initial plan. I can change my plans. It's up to me. And you too can change your plans and do things however you want to. Magic is your journey. I think I'll leave it as is and we'll make some decisions before playing it next time. Thank you very much for watching this video. As always, I will see you, my friends, in the next video. Free to play videos, I'm trying to do a couple of them a week. Thanks for watching, goodbye. My YouTube channel is proudly supported by hauntedflower.com, shipping officially licensed apparel anywhere in the world, and now featuring Magic the Gathering apparel and accessories. If you use the promo code CGB at your checkout, you can save 10% on any order. That's the promo code CGB at checkout on hauntedflower.com. That's hauntedflower.com.